chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about artificial abominations. I'm your host, Paul J. McSorley, and tonight and every other Wednesday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of Sylvester Barzi is myself, voice talent Paul J. McSorley. Now get your ticket ready, take your seat in our theater of the minds, and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our tale this evening is written by Sylvester Barzi and is performed by me, Paul J. McSorley. Meet Jeff. Jeff has a perfect life. Anything he wants, his AI Anna can get him. He wants to be a superhero? Anna gets him okay. Jeff wants to have a six-pack? AI makes it happen. No sweat. If you cross Jeff or don't play his games, then Anna deletes you. But today, Jeff is about to come across someone who shouldn't exist in his perfect world. Now, without further ado, I present to you, Lisa. Jeff, rise and shine. Today is going to be a wonderful day. The robotic female voice whispered into my ear, and like magic, my eyes popped open. I sat up and smiled as the birds flew gracefully through the sky. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Anna. Did you sleep well? Like the dead. And yourself? The dead don't sleep, and neither do I. What would you like for breakfast? My hand touches my chin and I playfully pretend I'm struggling to decide from a mountain of options. But we both know what it's going to be. A scramble made with three whole eggs and two egg whites. Bacon heated to exactly 165 degrees and removed from the pan to rest on an oak cutting board. Two pieces of toast with the edges cut off. Lastly, goat cheese on the side. It's the same thing every day. But I always say, surprise me. Will do. Should I play your messages from last night while you get ready? Yes, please. From Instagram. At real Tony Hawk. Sick move, man. You're getting so much better. I can't wait for our next lesson. At Cardi B. Press, 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 press. Well, you know the rest. Thanks, Jeff, for helping me with that song. It's gone triple platinum. From Twitter, at Fotis Trump. Thanks for getting that weapons bill thing signed by Korea. This is going to be huge. Huge. For my third re-election. From Facebook, Jennifer Lopez liked your most recent post. 
Anna is my AI life assistant. We have synced her to my life. It's a long process that involves smart tech talk and a lot of wires, but in the end, I get a life worth living. Jeff, you have an incoming call. Would you like to answer it? I try to think who would call during my daily routine. Most likely Lisa from the office asking me out for drinks after work. No, send it to voicemail. Lisa will have to get in line. Besides, I set my mornings in stone. Even the slightest misuse of time will throw off my whole damn day. One minute talking to Lisa means one less minute working on my fitness, or one less minute to close a deal. I spend the rest of my morning pondering whether or not sex was worth $50,000. I would never pay that much in my life, but if I broke down my day into payments by minutes, that's how much it would cost to get Lisa into bed. I could get a high-end call girl for half that, a hooker for even less, and a one-night stand for two drinks. If I sleep with Lisa, it opens up a door of future minutes that I can't get back. She could derail my work routine, coming into my office for a quickie. No, no, I can't have that. My hands tightened around the steering wheel of my car, and my thumbs drummed along the black leather. I haven't done this since the election party when Obama placed his glass on my first edition Harry Potter novel. But this morning proved with no doubt that Lisa isn't worth my time. Anna. The console turned to soft blue as she comes to life. My stats pop up on the wheel, letting me know how fast the car is going and what our route is. I don't think I remember how to drive a car even if I wanted to. Yes, Jeff? Please remove Lisa from all aspects of my life. Once removed, there will be no further contact from this person. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Very well. Done. Thank you. I honestly felt a small bit of anxiety coming into my chest. The whole thought of someone out there trying to derail my day. Not understanding that my time has value. My heart pounding in my chest, and it was a feeling I did not like. Anyway, it's best this way. Much like with Obama, everyone will forget about Lisa and Anna will work on finding another replacement for a female office crush. Hopefully, one that's not as forward and demanding of attention. The car pulls into my parking space, right next to the CEO spot. I fix my tie, grab my briefcase and casually make my way into the building. Good morning, Jeff. An overweight guard waves at me from behind the lobby desk, and I put him there as the first person I see to remind me why I wake up so damn early to work out. It's Mr. Richardson to you. Why do I have to keep reminding you of that? I'm sorry, Mr. Richardson. It won't happen again, he responded. It better not, or you'll be the next Obama. The elevator doors opened up, and I walked in. The next who? He replied. Exactly. I rolled my eyes as the elevator made its way to my destination. I watched as each number lit up. I'm not fully sure what most of the other floors are for, or who's on them. I just know I'm on the top floor. The only one that matters. Anna, could you please update the front desk guard? He keeps forgetting how to greet me. Sure thing, Jeff. Thank you. The doors open once again and I'm greeted by a round of applause. I smiled and gazed at all the grinning, but clearly jealous faces as our CEO, Mr. Bill Gates, walks over and shakes my hand. No, thank you for saving this company once again, Jeff. That deal was amazing. Bill looked around the room and nodded. Pointing at me, he continued. You worthless sons of bitches need to be more like Jeff. He gets the job done around here. Oh, there's only one Jeff. I smiled and turned around slowly to greet the soft and sultry voice that came up behind me. Anna clearly looked into my private files to create this one. Well, who are... Lisa. She laughed and tossed her arms around me. 
What the fuck is going on? I asked. Lisa took a step back and I felt that pounding in my chest once again. Everyone's eyes were on me. They were all judging me, questioning my reaction. Are you okay, Jeff? She asked me. Anna, pause this. I combed my fingers through my hair and sighed. Um, pause what? Lisa asked. My eyes came up and I turned around to see the room filled with concerned glares. Hey, big guy, maybe you should take a break. You did some splendid work. Go home and let the little people handle everything. Bill said as he patted me on the back and walked off, parting the sea of yes-men that were once applauding my grand achievement. You need some water or something? Lisa asked and I shook my head. No, Lisa. What I need to know is why the hell you're even here. I shouted. A hand grabbed hold of my shoulder and I looked over at a tall, well-dressed and clearly fit man. A man who I have never seen before and who shouldn't exist. No one is taller than me. No one is better looking than me. No one is anything. Don't talk to the lady like that. I pulled my shoulder free from his powerful grip and then raced past Lisa and the rest. I didn't stop or look around until I got to my office. I slammed the door behind me. Anna! Yes, Jeff? What the hell's going on? I dropped the blinds of my office, blocking out the massive glass window that allows the rest of the office to view the greatness that is me. Now they're all out there, whispering and judging. I don't understand what you mean. What I mean is, why is Lisa still here? I peeked through the blinds to see Lisa talking to Bill. She's crying. What the hell is she crying for? I'm the one who has to deal with her being here. You requested Lisa to be removed, not deleted. Since when do I have to be so damn specific? Since the last system update, would you like me to delete her? Yes, delete her. Like Obama, I commanded. Like who? Exactly. While today started out on a totally odd note, I get one thing out of it. I've never seen a deletion before. Normally, the person I remove isn't anywhere around me during the time of the request. So this should be a treat. My fingers shake slightly as they hold open the blinds. Delete, delete, delete. Deletion commencing. System error. All admin requests are temporarily on hold. What? There is something wrong with the system. What? Why? I don't know, Jeff. I'll have to check and find out. Anna, you yelled at me. I said, shocked. Sorry, I'm set to your emotional frequency. You need to remain calm. You're saying that I have to live this hell of a life until you figure out what's going on, and you want me to remain calm? I tossed my hands up in the air and slid down my office door. I'll get right on that. Remain calm for three major reasons. One, I can't work if you're stressed. I need all my focus on dealing with this system error. Two, if you're not calm, then the simulations may act out of character. They're used to you being the definition of perfection. Well, I guess you're right. I can't let my peeps down. What's the third reason? Today's Monday. Okay. And that means what to... The office door was pushed with such force it would have fallen off its hinges, but thankfully my head was there to keep it in place. Son of a bitch! My hands latched onto the back of my skull and I rolled myself away from the doorway. Jeff? Jeff? Are you okay? The door pushed open and Lisa's pixie-like haircut and caramel hazel eyes poked in through the gap. I hate her. 
I hate her more than Obama. Way more than that idiot guard and... There's a shooter in the building. A shooter? I repeated. Lisa slammed the door behind her and flicked the lights off. Her fingers cautiously held open the blinds. He killed Frank down at the front desk and has been stopping on each floor. We need to hide. Oh, Anna! Anna! I shouted. Lisa's hand slapped onto my lips and she forced my head back into the tan carpet. She sat on my chest. Her skirt seemed to push up because of this action. But I still hate her. Do you know what hide means, Jeff? I nodded. Clearly, you don't, or you wouldn't be fucking yelling at the top of your lungs. I mumbled under her palm and Lisa sighed and released my lips. I need to call Anna to shut it down. Lisa stared at me for a moment and then pinched the brim of her nose where her eyes met. What are you going on about? Anna, my life assistant? We set up an active shooter for every third Monday of the month to shake things up. Normally, I rustle him to the ground or deflect his bullets with a clipboard and kill him. I laughed and rested my head back on the carpet. One time, I beat him in a dance-off. Lisa slowly stood up and stared down at me. Her hands were firmly on her hips, and she had this look on her face. The same look my mother used to get when I told her about my dreams of starting a seahorse rodeo or any dream. What the hell are you talking about? She asked. Just wait. I tapped the screen on my watch and it lit up a light blue. Anna, I need your help. You are nuts. Lisa grabbed the end of my desk and started dragging it across the room. Just lie there and shut the hell up. Anna? I tapped my watch once again and sighed. She must be deep in the program and can't receive my calls. Yep. That's exactly why your fictional cyber genie isn't answering your calls. She jammed the corner of the desk up against the door handle and Lisa continued to peep through the blinds at the elevators. The office was eerily silent. Lisa knew everyone else was hiding in their offices or wherever they could. I saw her eyes scanning the area, most likely deciding if leaving to find a new spot was worth her getting shot. She thought I was crazy, and maybe I am, because I'm letting the opinion of an artificial intelligence impact me. There's one good thing about this. What? Your robot girlfriend comes with a lifetime warranty? She's not my girlfriend. What the hell is the good thing about being trapped in your office with an active shooter running around? It's only 9.30. He won't make it to our floor until 1. Right now, he should just be getting to the fourth floor. Her eyes peered through the gap in the blinds. She scanned the silver elevator doors until her eyes met the red number 3 on top. The number faded and a bright red number 4 appeared. Through the dead silence of the floor, she could hear faint pops, one right after another. Lisa looked down at me. Let's say you're not crazy and that you didn't plan this shooting. I didn't know that subject was in the conversation. If you've done this before, I guess technically I planned... Lisa's fingers snapped and my eyes popped up to meet her glare. How do we get out alive? She asked. I told you I normally step up and save the day. So what are you waiting for? I looked down at my watch and Lisa rolled her eyes. Right. Your robot girlfriend does the thinking for you. She doesn't think for me. She just helps out, I said. Well, she's not here so it's time to put your big boy pants on. Lisa is so pushy and demanding. No wonder she called early this morning. Her forwardness was annoying at first, but now it's attractive. Hey, focus. You can do all your creepy staring when we get out. 
I think we can make it to the stairs and... Can't he set fires in all the stairwells? You'll die of smoke inhalation before you even get anywhere near the lobby. I finally picked myself up off the floor and Lisa's eyes got wide. I straightened my tie and tugged at my shirt, which felt oddly tight. Everything felt tight. Really tight. What are you staring at? Lisa's finger shot out and she pointed at me. You're fat. My eyes trailed down my suit to see a large gut ripping through my shirt. Anna! Lisa leaped forward and covered my mouth once again. This time, my gut made the process a lot more difficult and way less sexy. Listen. I took a moment to listen, but all I could hear was my heart racing, and all I could focus on was her fingers wrapped around my lips. I attempted to say something, and that's when I heard it. A faint voice in the office begging. It's Bill, Lisa said. We could hear his cries for mercy and failed attempts at negotiating. He offered the entire company. I would have jumped at that, but the next thing I heard solidified that the shooter and I were not the same. A loud blast filled the office and Lisa jumped. Her trembling body fell into mine and now I could feel both our hearts racing. This isn't right. I pulled free of Lisa and went to the window. I made a gap in the blinds to see what was going on. Bill was lying in the middle of the office, blood pushing free from the hole in his head. My eyes scanned until I saw him, dressed in all black with gloves, boots, and a bulletproof vest. Everything was black except for one odd thing. It's a rabbit? Lisa cleared the tears from her eyes as she crept up behind me. What? She whispered. He's got a rabbit's head on, I said. Lisa looked through the gap in the blinds. It's the white rabbit. I looked over at Lisa and raised an eyebrow. I go to Disneyland a lot. That's the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. I wish Anna deleted you before you lost all your sex appeal, says the Pillsbury Doughboy. My hand rested on my gut and I fought back an internal waterfall of tears that was building up. Lisa elbowed me and pointed at the white rabbit. He was staring right at us with his glassy eyes and cartoonish grin. His black gloved hand came up and he slowly waved at us. I started waving back only to have Lisa slap me in the side of my head. What the hell is wrong with you? What? I didn't want to be rude. I stared back through the gap in the blinds, but the white rabbit was nowhere to be found. I thought you said we had until one. We do, or we should. I'm not sure who the hell that guy is. I ran my hands down my face and then moved the desk. Lisa's hand slapped onto the desk and she stared at me. What the hell do you think you're doing? I need to get back home. My house has a hub, and it is the only sure-fired way to get through to Anna. Here we go with this Anna mess again. I played along to keep you calm, but I'm not risking my life for your imaginary friend. You open that door, and you are as good as dead to me. Listen, Obama number two. Lisa rolled her eyes and released the desk. Not only do I have to deal with you but I have a crazed shooter running about. I can't find Anna, and most importantly, I lost my six-pack. Lisa closed her eyes. The words that slipped from her lips were a mixture of frustration and sadness. If you leave, you'll die. I can't die. I paid for the deluxe package, I said with a smile. I forgot what it was like to run with a gut. I felt my skin burning from rubbing against my clothes and excess skin. I took to the steps like a toddler descending for the first time. I sadly tumbled down more steps than I feel comfortable admitting. The sprinkler system put the fires in the stairwell out. The smoke was still strong and my lungs were getting weaker. My train of thought got burned alive when I saw him. 
He was standing at the bottom of the steps, waving his index finger from side to side. Who the hell are you? His hand went to his chin and his fingers drummed. He shrugged and took a step closer. Just great. You're a rabbit and a mime. He nodded and stopped cold on the steps. He looked around for a moment and then dropped his shotgun before pulling a large machete out from a sheath on his hip. I took a cautious step back. This was not how today was meant to go. I should be getting my sixth medal of honor for saving this shithole of a company. I was going to have nasty sex with one survivor in the janitor's closet. The machete came up ever so slowly in the air. The tip pointed toward me, and like any good red-blooded American, I ran. I flung the fire escape door open and my gut entered the floor before I did. I got one good foot into the room before my next step slipped out from under me and I went slipping and sliding through what I recall being the accounting office. Papers lined the slick tile floor. My shirt stuck to me. My dress shoes slid along the floor like a bobsled down an icy mountain. I shot my hands out to brace myself. My legs grew steady as I finally stood. My hands were slick and somewhat sticky at the same time. I noticed the blood just moments before I noticed the bodies. It was like a soldier in a PTSD flashback. I was standing in hell, one that I knew shouldn't be here. Dismembered bodies lined the floor. Organs hung from lights like demonic Christmas decorations. My eyes took in as much horror as my mind could stand, and then the devil appeared with his white furry mascot head, tapping his machete along his side as he made his way closer to me. What do you want? Money? I'm loaded. Just let me know the account number and I'll give you any amount you want. The white rabbit came to a stop. He rubbed the white fur along his chin and then stared at me with those large blank eyes. His head shook from side to side and then his black combat boots made it through the madness of bodies and blood with ease while I made a backward retreat like a baby doe standing for the first time. The machete pointed at me and then a loud blast rang out. My eyes locked shut as his blood carried through the room and mixed with the blood of his victims. What was this talk about money? Lisa said. The white rabbit's body dropped to his knees and then collapsed forward, revealing my favorite person in all the multiverse. Lisa! She lowered the smoking shotgun barrel, and I slowly tiptoed through the grim garden of bodies that lined the floor and only stopped long enough to kick the white rabbit in his furry mascot head. You came for me? My arms wrapped around her and I lifted her into the air. Lisa was fighting back a smile before she shouted, Put me down! I laughed and lowered her to the bloody floor once again. Let's get out of here. Wait. I grabbed her hands. Why did you come for me? I looked down at my blood-soaked shoes. I mean, after everything I tried to do. Everything I said about you. What did you say? Lisa asked. Never you mind your sweet saintly head about that. Why come after me? I asked. Lisa sighed and then shrugged. I think you're crazy. But even if you're not, I couldn't let you do this alone, she said. Because you love me? I asked with a smile. No, because you're a human being and no one deserves to die alone, she said. I wasn't sure if Lisa was crying. It was hard to make out anything clearly through all the tears that were running down my face. I love you too. I don't love you, Lisa shouted. And we will not die, because love like ours is what they write books about, no. It's what they make movies about, and that kind of love can't die. Lisa took a step back and I pulled her closer. Don't, my little warrior princess. You don't have to hide behind that mask of witty remarks and sexual... Jeff, Lisa whispered. Yes, my love? I asked. Shut up 
and run, she said. What? Lisa's hands grabbed a hold of my shoulders, and what I thought was going to be a kiss and a loving embrace turned into her spinning me quickly around through the dark red blood until I made a complete 180, and I was staring at it. The white rabbit staring at me with that blank glare, cartoonish smile, and bloody hole in his chest. It wasn't big enough to put my head through, but I was pretty damn sure my arms could fit in it like a glove. Oh, I wasted no further time with Lisa's poorly timed flirting, and I took off like an angel out of hell. My shoes slipped and slid, but luckily the only falling I did was forward, putting a greater distance between me and that killer rabbit. I blew down the steps, my red footprints leaving a trail behind me. My lungs burned. The side of my ribs ached, and my gut continued to slap into any and everything that got in my way. My hands pulled open the metal lobby door, and I broke out of the darkness that covered the stairwell into the afternoon sun of the glass-covered lobby. It had a glass ceiling, glass doors, and more glass windows than I can even count. I stood still with my hand clutching my chest. You son of a bitch. My head spun around to see Lisa exploding through the stairwell door. Her eyes told me she wanted to slap me in the face or maybe kick me in the nuts. Her eyes told me that, but her overall face told me there was no time to stop. We stormed through the glass double doors and into the parking lot. I didn't need to turn around. I didn't need to listen for his footsteps. All I needed to do was run, because I knew he was stalking us, hunting us down like a lion after its prey. Christine, unlock the doors! An automatic click sounded and I ripped the driver's side door open. I jumped in only to have my gut pressed up against the wheel. My fingers fumbled for the adjustment handle. Lisa's hand shot between my legs and she pulled up on the handle, causing my seat to fly back and air to freely enter my body. Thanks. The car started up and before we knew it, we were whipping out of the parking lot with no sight of the white rabbit in our rear view. Who the hell is Christine? I thought your obsession was with Anna. Lisa asked. That's rude. Anna's my life assistant that's meant to make everything easy and perfect for me in here. Christine, my fingers rubbed along the wheel as the car started on its self-driving path home. That's just what I named this beauty. You named your self-driving car Christine like the horror movie? Lisa asked. Yeah, I know it's dumb. No, I like it. It fits. Lisa ran her hand over her face and rested her head back on the seat. Why would you sign up for this? She asked. Sign up for what? I looked over at her and then laughed. Oh, why wouldn't I? I get to be who I want, do what I want, look how I want, I said. Yeah, but none of it is real. There's no surprise to it. Wouldn't it get boring? Sometimes it does, so I just change it up. One time I just went hitchhiking across the country and got picked up by all my favorite movie stars. A smile grew on my face and I shook my head. Wait, so you believe me now? I asked. No, I just wanted to know why someone would trade their life for a fake one. Not everyone is happy with their life. Some people can't get out of bed. Some people have family who pretend they're dead because it's easier to tell people that than to say, Oh, Jeff's obesity got out of control and now he can't walk. The actual world told me I was a mistake and I might as well die sooner rather than later. My hands rubbed along the leather seat and I smiled. In here, I can have a life worth living. But it's not real. Well, it's real to me and that's all that matters. The conversation died out after that. Lisa wasn't the first person to point out the lack of realness to my alternative world. My mother told me I was wasting my life and money. 
but she also told her friends I was dead. So I figured you can't waste life if it's already over. Is that your house? Lisa asked. Yeah, how did you know? It's the biggest one and overlooking the city from the top of a hill. It's probably got a bat cave, she replied. I rolled my eyes. Being Batman isn't as fun as you'd think it would be. It was a lot of work. The car was silent for a moment, and then we broke out laughing. I looked over at Lisa and smiled. I'm happy you didn't get deleted. Um, thank you? Why would you do that anyway? It's a pretty dick thing to do, Lisa said. I thought you didn't believe me. I don't, but deleting a whole person, delusional or not, it's still a dick thing to do, she said. I sighed. Yeah, it was. Your call annoyed me this morning. It messed up my morning routine. I didn't call you this morning, Lisa said. A blade crashed through the windshield, peppering us with shards of glass. My cheek stung. Blood ran down my chin and covered my gut. The blade pulled back, and the white rabbit's soulless eyes came into view as he glared at us. Son of a bitch hitched a ride! His head disappeared, and then the machete blade sliced down through the roof of the car like a hot knife through butter. Jeff! I looked over to see the blade had sliced into Lisa's arm. I looked at the shotgun in the back seat, and I went for it. The machete retracted and took with it a chunk of flesh off my stomach. Warm liquid ran down my pants. I wasn't sure if I pissed myself or if I was bleeding out. My fingers brushed against the shotgun, and I forced my body forward. More warm liquid pushed out as my gut pressed against the seat. I grabbed the shotgun, and then his cartoonish grin came into view in the back window. I pulled the trigger, and my ear began to steadily ring as the blast filled the car. Glass scattered onto the road, and I twisted quickly until I was on my back. Lisa was screaming something, but I couldn't make it out. Then the white fur broke through the driver's side window. You son of a bitch! I pulled the trigger and another blast filled my ears. If I wasn't deaf before, I was sure I would be now. The shot missed its target, but found a new one as Christine's dashboard exploded. The car started to zig and zag on the blacktop. Lisa quickly grabbed the wheel, but it was no use. Christine jumped the curb and crashed into a lamppost. My body slammed into the roof of the car and then down into the back seat. I got a glimpse of Lisa before she went flying through the windshield. Jeff, I have an urgent message from New Life Industry. Hey Jeff, it's Josh, your IT tech. I noticed you didn't listen to my first message, so I listed this as urgent. There is a virus in our system. I'm not sure if it has made it into your files, but... We're telling everyone to just stay home, preferably as close to your main hub as possible. The further away you get, the more likely you'll run into the virus. Anyway, outside your hub, the reset, update, and deletion options seem to be down for other users. This just means your day is going to be on a loop with any changes from today carrying on into the next day. So, just be mindful of that and relax until we get this under control. Oh, we're calling the virus the White Rabbit. So if you see any rabbits, run the other way. Message completed. Jeff, are you still there? Jeff? Jeff? New day starting in 3, 2, 1. Jeff, rise and shine. Today is going to be a wonderful day. That warm liquid. It's most definitely blood. I stare up at the ceiling, motionless. Unable to sit up or get out of bed. I think my back is broken. He sits in the corner, staring at me. With those soulless eyes... 
petting Lisa's head in his lap. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Jeff? Are you still there? I hope you enjoyed Lisa, as written by Sylvester Barzi and performed by Paul J. McSorley. Sylvester Barzi is a father, a husband, a soldier, and anything goes horror writer. He writes what he wants and does what he likes. And what he likes is horrifying. As for me, Paul J. McSorley, you can find more of me right here on our very own network, as well as over on Audible. And be sure to check out Fear from the Heartland, which has over 120 episodes for you to love and enjoy. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Paul J. McSorley, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. <laughs>